our vision is to love Jesus, to build community, and to transform lives. We are part of the vision of the whole worldwide church of God. There are no denominations in heaven. Every church will one day come before the Almighty God, the King of Kings, and be answerable for the time that we've spent here and what we've done with our lives. We have the Bible to guide us towards Jesus. And in the Bible, we read of these three themes. We think and hear of people like King David, whose great love for God is lived out in the Psalms. We hear the stories of Solomon building his temple. We see Nehemiah rebuilding the temple. We see Moses' face transformed. And we see that every character in the Old Testament is a character in the Bible because of the way they are or are not transformed by God. In the New Testament, it's the same thing. The disciples loved Jesus, not just followed him. Jesus said, Peter, on you will I build my church. He called him the rock. Every character of the New Testament is a character in the Bible because of the way in which they are or are not transformed by God. The question is naturally for us, in what way will we love God? In what way will we build things for Him? In what way will our lives be transformed? And in what way will we play a part in the transformation of the lives of others? We are also a poverty alleviation society. Do you get that? Being in the church is big time about poverty. If you go to the Sermon on the Mount, you will see, blessed are the poor in dot, dot, dot. You could spend a year just going through that sermon. But there are at least three big categories. There are those who have a poverty in their physical surroundings, in their bodies. There are those who have a poverty in their minds, but in a sense their spirits are still allowed to worship. And there are those who are poor in their spirits, which means even their hearts of worship are in some ways impeded. They have a poverty. What's most important is that we engage in the poverty nearest to us before going to the poverty furthest from us. Do you understand? It doesn't mean that we don't go to the poverty furthest from us, but it does mean we avoid what we've seen in the past few generations of the church, which is that we avoid because we're uncomfortable about the poverty nearest to us, so we just like to go as far away as we can. If you talk to somebody about what is mission, they immediately, the word Africa will immediately get in there. Yeah? You talk about your workplace, it's my private faith. It's the other way around. The first poverty we are called to engage in is the poverty among people like us. And I would love for you to watch, this is a one minute intro to what's happening in just one part of church life, but I think it gives a flavor of what I'm talking about. Let's watch this. This is BBC News 24. has an addiction to divorce and family breakdown. There are about 3.8 million of our children caught up in the family justice January system. is the busiest time of year for relationship counseling. Relationship. Cynics even call the first week of the new year Divorce Week. Here, one of the most striking ones was the head of the family court division whose voice was in there, Sir Paul Coleridge. I asked somebody this the other day, how many children do you think are caught in the court system due to divorce? Did anybody hear it? You may have heard it there. 3.8 million. 3.8 million children. Now, if you don't know that divorce is a, has a serious impact on a child's upbringing. If you don't know that that upbringing, the lack of having two parents around, can have a serious impact on a child, then you wouldn't be paying attention. If you also don't know that God redeems every situation, there is no divorced situation that God cannot redeem. There is no family that God cannot heal, whether they get back together or there's healing in the divorce. But 
this is the, this is the poverty closest to us. Family breakdown in areas exactly like this. People who are poor in spirit who have no idea to even start in answering the question, what is the meaning of my life? There's not even a context. We had a guy here the other day helping out. He said, you know what? I know absolutely nothing about church or Christianity. Zero. This is the poverty closest to us. Now, what we're about to do is have a visual understanding of some of the things that have been going on here. This does not represent the whole of what's been going on, but it does represent part. And I'm going to read out some numbers, and we're going to see something coming through the doors in a minute. But just so you understand the numbers between the numbers and what comes through the door. What comes through the door is one-third of the numbers that I'm talking about. This is what we've seen over these past two and a half years. We have seen the Alpha Course. Are we ready? The Alpha Course. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. Are we ready? The Alpha Course. Come on out. <laughs> we have seen, can you just keep clapping? It's just more fun. We've seen 150 people come on the Alpha Course here, at least 50 of whom have been from completely outside the church. Just keep, Jerry, just keep everybody coming. The Marriage Preparation Course, you can just tie them straight on, Lottie. Thank you very much. The Marriage Preparation Course, we've run four courses. We've seen 36 people, and all 36 have been from outside of the church. We've seen 54, well done, tie them on there, well done. We've seen 54 people on the marriage course, 20 of whom have come from completely outside the church. 54 people on the parenting courses, the parenting children course, the parenting teenagers course, 15 of them from completely outside the church. Friday youth, we've seen 30 people so far. Both nights, uh, the past two nights, we've seen uh, police issues. <laughs> we've seen child protection issues. We're dealing with vulnerable young people. We've seen all of these guys coming along. And the Room for Work Job Club, we've seen 43 people come on the job club, 40 of whom, 40 of whom are from completely outside of the church. What's a job club? Well, a job club is a place where people come and they learn employability skills and they network with each other and socialize, develop plans for themselves and move ahead and get work. On the train station at Hampton Wick and saw the little flyers, everyone here has amazing skills, but you can tell that they don't always feel that confident. With people like me, uh, I've got two degrees and uh, ten years experience working in industry, and I've had ten years off to have kids, uh, and I want to use all that experience. Uh, and many are going through the midline crisis, those, those dreaded words, but actually from this, an awful lot of people then start looking at their real passions in life. Mm. And I've been unemployed for two years, so now I've gained confidence. It's an invaluable resource for those of us who are unemployed who have been unable to find um, clubs for this benefit. Crucial, um, informative experiences to go out back into the workplace and give back what we've achieved possibly through these clubs. Getting out there and meeting people in the same position, understanding their difficulties and their successes and passing that information on and reassuring everybody that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that by working together we can actually get to our own goal which is obviously back into some form of employment. Mm. Mel, tell us why have I come to ask you what is it that we were talking about the other day? Okay, okay. So, um, so Graham is obviously, as part of Vision Sunday, going to talk about the resources that we need as a church. Okay, and uh, we were praying on Tuesday um, in the prayer room. And Graham was asking for us to pray for him on how to give this message. And, and, um, and myself and Ali, who's, who's not here today, we both really felt that it shouldn't be on Graham to always be up at the front asking everybody else, you know, can you give us more money to do um, all the things you want to do? It felt as though, we both really felt this, that it's, it's a collective responsibility. We're, we're no different, really, <clears throat> 
from the people in the early church, you know, the, the, you know, the very first disciples who were setting up a church, they had a bunch of stuff that God wanted them to do. And God has a bunch of stuff that he wants us to do. And it's not, you know, church isn't an institution, it's a collection of people. And we are that church, we're a community. And God has a whole bunch of things that he wants us as a community to do. And so it feels as though it's just a collective responsibility piece, this, this whole kind of visioning and resourcing that vision. And it's not on Graham and it's not on Jerry. It's, it's all of us to figure out, well, how do we do, how do we deploy our resources so we can get done what God wants us to do in this community? And Ali had a really nice picture and she just said, you know, when we talk about giving, you feel as though you're giving something away. But she said it's not like that. It's kind of like if you, let, if, you, if you give a coat to somebody, you then see somebody walking around wearing that coat. And it's, it's there, it's being used. And all these balloons are kind of a picture of that. We're not just giving money away. We're investing. We're investing money in our community. And you'll see the benefits of all of that walking around and, you know, within our community. So that's what was on my heart and on Alice's heart, and which is why Graham then said, okay, good, you can tell the whole church that <laughs> on Sunday. So here I am. So, yeah. Very good. You were ask me I know. So, so what I wanted Graham to kind of tell me and tell all of us here is just, you know, what really is going on with the church finances and where are we up to? So the brief from Mel was to tell you in the simplest possible way. And then we're going to go on into where, where's our heart, where's our vision going in, in, in the heart space. The simplest possible way to explain our finances at this point is as follows. We have spent over this two and a half years approximately 250,000 pounds on fixing up these buildings. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. Now, where has that come from? Almost exactly half has come from us. It's come from our normal earnings. We have a few people here who are really wealthy. There aren't that many. Most of us are normal families in this area who've just worked really hard and given very, very generously. And we've raised that money. We've also been able to apply for grants. We've asked for gifts from outside. And amazingly, it's almost exactly half has come from outside. So a quarter of a million pounds we've raised and spent here. Half has been given, half has been given by us. It's important to know that there is no constant stream of money from some mysterious source. It's one of the important things you have to say on every giving Sunday. There is no, we are not subsidized by the Church of England. Uh, we subsidize them. Uh, we are the Church of England, yes? As in, the Church of England is only subsidized through the giving of local churches like us. And all of our operating on a given year, all of our staff, all of our interns, all of our heating, all of our insurance across two buildings, all of that activity, all of the things that leads to supporting all of this is around a quarter of a million pounds, is around 250,000 pounds. Now what's happened is we have grown that budget. We've grown the, uh, that's fine. Thank you very much for that message. I'm getting messages from the back. And uh, we've grown the, we've grown the church, if you can imagine a line like this, and I'm purposely not putting this on the screen because these are not technical terms here, but these help us to understand. Am I still doing okay? Yeah. yeah. We've grown the church like this, and we've grown the budget like this, and the giving has kind of gone like this. And there's a little space in here that we need to catch up on. Yes? Now, we hit a time just before Christmas where it was looking, it was looking pretty, we all had to do a lot of belt tightening. And I can promise you, we have belt tightened in every possible way we can. Celine and I, this was a big thing. At home, we switched from Ocado to Tesco's. <laughs> it was a big thing, guys, okay? Uh, you know, and I, I think that actually, I think that's the spirit of where we are at today. I think that if we, <laughs> do you know, I repent, I repent of all of the nasty things I've said about Tesco's, and I have said a lot of nasty things about Tesco's. When you get to Asda. We may need to go to Asda. <laughs> Uh, but, the, 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 you know, we've done that in our own family. We've tightened our belts. Uh, we've, um, we've tightened the belt in the church. And I can safely say to you, I can say to you with confidence that I believe our budget is where it ought to be. You can come, and I encourage all of us to come to our annual meeting in May where we can go through the finance in a kind of nuts and bolts way. But the net result at this point is that we're £50,000 short. And we can come to that in three different ways. One is that those who are new to church can start giving. 
that would be absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of heart that you might have around that. If you come from quite a kind of modest income in your family, it would be great if you just start giving in a very modest way. If you are extremely wealthy and you're new to church, it'd be so wonderful if you would start giving in an extremely kind of that kind of way. That'd be really great. I, you know, it's, uh, these are the things. See, I'm just telling you, because Mel's here, I'm just telling you how it is. Yeah? The second way is that uh, if each of us who is giving already could think about tightening our belt along the lines of a kind of Ocado to Tesco thing in the family budget, if you could think about perhaps even giving, imagine your cheapest cup of tea that's possible for one to buy on the high streets where you go. Imagine that cup of tea per day more. That would be amazing. If some of you could give a kind of Starbucks coffee, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking, Starbucks coffee per day more, that would be amazing. And if some, some of you really like those kind of Starbucks, the big Starbucks coffee with the kind of, do you know what I mean, the extra flavors and all that kind of stuff, if some of you could give that much more per day, it would be absolutely amazing. And then if some of you could just, even one or two, could just escape the, the city bonuses, you know, cut down a little bit, and there were just one or two who were paid in kind of city bonuses, then, you know, we can easily make that 50,000 pounds happen. Is that very clear? Mel, will you pray for me to carry on with the rest of this talk? <laughs> Lord, we, we thank you for everything that you have done in the church so far. We thank you for all the provision that you've given us as a church, and we thank you for all of the blessings that you've given everybody in this church community. Lord, I just pray for Graham now. I just pray that he speaks really clearly um, to everybody here and that they are your words, Lord, and that you put in the hearts of everybody here a real sense of what you would like them to do, what you would like them to contribute. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave today, it's not just a Graham vision, it's, it's a church vision. And we're all brought into that, Lord, and we all know which part we're going to play in bringing that to life and really bringing your kingdom here to come in Hampton, Wick, and Teddington and all the surrounding communities, Lord. Just give that, give that to you now. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Let's give Mel a round of applause. It's really helpful. I'm more than halfway through. Don't worry. I just want us to have done the nuts. Was it good to do the nuts and bolts that way? Is that helpful? Because it allows us now just to focus on where our hearts are and where our heart is collectively as a church. If we think of church as a plant, there are many pictures in the Bible of the church as a vine connected to God, the mustard seed which grows. There's something of the fruit of that, which is the fruit of God's Spirit in our lives. There's something of the branches of this tree. The parable of the mustard seed is great because it says that the structure, the, the plant grows and birds can find refuge in this great and mighty tree. So there's something about the fruit, there's something about the structure of the church. But this year is something for us of a year of discipleship in a particular way, which means if the whole thing is a tree, we're adding fertilizer. And we've been doing that through the whole time. If we were spending time going in and we weren't seeing fruit, I think we might have a different strategy. But when we see the amount of fruit we've had, you'll know from gardening that when you see much fruit, you need to keep adding much fertilizer. And that's what I would love for us to commit ourselves to in this year ahead. To that aim, Jerry and I have been going to every possible discipleship conference you can imagine. Uh, and it's fantastic in the, what I fondly call Christianistan, which is the kind of Christian world worldwide. Everybody's talking about this. So what we've been trying to do is distill down what are the key ideas that we've been learning. And I'd like for us to think of three passages uh, as we do that. The first is 2 Corinthians 3.18, which says that we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, it's not a static point. It's not an on-off switch. It's ever-increasing glory in that passage. Ephesians 3, 14, we hear the same thing. We see the prayer. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp, if you know these words, say them along with me, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You see again, a never-ending journey in that direction. Then in Luke 9, we see this journey divided into three camps. What's in Luke 9? I'm not going to read the whole passage. This is your homework. You can go back and study to see if what I'm saying is true. In Luke 9, we read about the feeding of the 5,000. We see that there are 5,000 people gathered together to learn about who Jesus is. We see that there is a group of disciples who've been journeying with Jesus, and they are to do the feeding on behalf of Jesus, but they in that story have a problem of faith. Do you remember? They don't believe that there's going to be enough food. They're willing, but they don't see how it can happen. Jesus has to teach those who are journeying. They're willing. They don't quite get it, but eventually it all comes together. And then at the end of the story, Peter is before Jesus and has that admission, my Lord and my God. He's the one who's really following Jesus at that point. He's fully surrendered his life to Christ. And there must have been others watching, otherwise we wouldn't have had that story to record. So we see there are those who are learning, those who are journeying, and those who are following. If you're thinking, I think I heard that before, you heard it last week from Jerry. The way we've split up this vision season is to say the most important part of our vision is the love of Jesus. And Jerry spoke about this last week. What I'm doing today is setting out for us the way in which we might think about how we as a church engage with people in those different heart places. You could say, do I have a kind of learning heart at this point? Do I have a kind of journeying heart? Or do I have a kind of following heart? Discipleship of Christ is happening when your worst becomes a little better, a little bit more like Christ each day. If you're not pursuing your worst parts and hoping to see them transformed, you are not doing discipleship. Do you see what I mean? I'd love for us to hear from Jerry and Dan. Can we hear from Jerry and Dan? Come and join us, Jerry and Dan. Come on up, Dan. Um, Dan, how on earth did you end up here? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Well, I think four months ago, I definitely wouldn't have been here. I'd say that. So I guess my, it's a story of faith and you know, tran- transform, transforming lives. So I'd say my faith has been bells, smells, and keep it to yourselves. I think that's how I'd summarize it. Um, it's very personal, kept it in. Definitely wouldn't have done any of this hands up in the air or anything like that. Um, my, my wife um, sort of has been on that journey with me, but she's very much not used to that at all, very much expression. Um, not for me, um, but she's been coming here probably about the last you know, 12 months, sort of on a monthly basis, and then you know, she's had, talking to Graham about, you know, want Dan to come, and Graham says, he'll be there in his time, his own time, mm-hmm. and I think that came in Jan this year, when, um, yeah, I came into, came into the church, really, for, for the first time, and yeah, I, I got over the hands in the air, and, <laughs> and in fact... In fact, earlier when we were going through songs, I noticed I had two hands up in the air. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, um, and you've joined the Alpha course, and, and how are you getting on there? Wow. Um, I think this goes back into the journey, really. So, I had faith, of, um, but as, you know, as I just described it. So, the Alpha course, and yeah, it's been an absolutely incredible ride over the last... Eight, six, six weeks, six weeks, six, seven weeks. So yeah, you you go on the Alpha course, and those have been on the Alpha course, and you see these talks, and you hear about people's lives being transformed. And to be honest, the first couple of weeks, I sat there thinking, yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this ain't going to happen here. I'm afraid, not you know, too too rational. And then really over the last yeah, as you say, six weeks, I've I really feel a transformation really and to fact even to stand here and tell you about this is a huge thing so I think the first really was the um, when I went to prayer room which was a few weeks back and I went in with a long list bang 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 went through a list in an hour yeah it's great I prayed for all these people fantastic sort of came out thinking was that really what I was meant to do in a prayer room it's got to be okay felt good came to the church on a Sunday and Jerry came over and prayed for me and I went back 
on Sunday night, I had a, an, a yearning to go back in again to the prayer room. So I booked um, Monday morning, the, so it was about two weeks ago. And I didn't have an agenda this time, just went in there and wow. I just lay in, um, sort of kneeled in front of a cross and yeah, just wept for 30 minutes. I mean, I can't believe I'm admitting it here now. <laughs> but yeah, I did, uh, I, I wept and it was, it was, that was amazing. It really was absolutely amazing. Um, and then obviously continuing the Alpha journey, come back and you know, I've seen some others in our course who've been who are on this journey and transformed and it's amazing to see, it really is. And then we had, which Graham said um, about earlier, we had our Alpha day yesterday. So Holy Spirit, what the hell is a Holy Spirit? I don't know. <laughs> you know, you do the, uh, you know, what I'm used to, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I thought it was just the two words to, you know, do the cross. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, and I have to say, the Holy Spirit came yesterday for me. I, it was amazing. It was, yeah, I'm still trying to feel completely overwhelmed by it. But, yeah, no, it came yesterday. It was, so that's been my, my journey in Alpha. And, yeah, it's been incredible so I really recommend anyone here who hasn't done it and wants to do it definitely sign up when it starts again in May yeah first of May be there <laughs> well done Dan well done think about what you've heard from Dan think about those three hearts the learning heart the journeying heart the following heart look at how quickly things have been going for him look at the excitement the passion that we have when you go from being learning and we're we, guys we are very good at helping people with that learning heart. We're a great church to come to. If you're just thinking about who God is, you're thinking about church, you want to come here, you'll be able to see how Christians behave, but you'll also feel like you can sit and watch from the sidelines until you're ready to journey forward into that. We have these amazing courses. This is a very crass analogy, but if you think about an organization that has a product if the product, the tangible things are these courses, if we don't know and live and breathe the product, we won't be able to sell it. Do you understand what I mean? If you're not engaged in the huge activity of learning that we have, if you don't know what this is all about and you're a regular member of this church, you need to be involved. I, want every, I don't want anybody to be a regular member in this church who hasn't been on the Alpha course. I just don't think it would work. I don't want any married couple to be here for more than about two or three years before you've gone on the marriage course. It's really important because people are looking. As soon as you're here for a little while, people look to you. They want to know how does your faith tick? How does your marriage tick? How do you deal with your kids? So it's your responsibility, people who've been here for a while, to know what's going on with all the things we have in this learning heart. The two other hearts are the kind of journeying heart and the following heart. Now, here's what's happened. Here's what happens when you've been a Christian a little while. You say, oh, yeah, I'm, of course, I'm a follower of Christ. Absolutely. Pay no attention to the fact that I'm a nasty git every once in a while. Let's just leave that aside. I give regularly. I come to church. Or take it the other way. Well, actually, I talk a really good talk about faith. But actually, you know, I never turn up. But I've got a major problems with my diary. Or actually... I say that I can pray, and I'll be honest, I, this is a, you know, we had a great thing at the Women's Pastorate on vulnerability. I'll tell you my one. I heard this message from somebody the other day. They said, you need to have time where you, when in prayer where you tell God, you say, God, please, if you're going to give me an idea in this time of prayer, please, would you just hold that idea off for a minute? Will you promise you'll give it back to me another time? Because I just want to be still. For me, my quietest times of prayer are my most creative. They're the times when I'm writing down a million ideas. And I heard that, and I thought, actually, that was a great reminder to me to get between journeying and following. Following Christ, there were times where Christ emptied himself. So that was a lesson to me. If we, this is my cutting it down to one minute, if those of us who think we've been around for a little while aren't as passionate about the life change we've just heard from Dan in our lives, we're missing the boat. Do you, do you get it? What does Dan want to see from us? He doesn't want to see us sitting here in the worship saying, yeah, 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 it's nice for you that you've had a great time on Alpha and everything seems to be pretty whizzy. But for me, I'm just steady as she goes. That's the kind of Christian life I have. If he sees that, or anybody else, if these people see that, they will be completely uninspired. Whereas if they see our heart that says, I am desperate to die to Christ 
If there is any offending part in me, I want to get rid of it. I want to be fully surrendered to the living God. I'll give you an example. Now, this is where I had this very delicately put, and I'm kind of now getting down to it. What if I said to you, for instance, hey, what do you think about giving more to your most expensive holiday than to the church? Right? Hmm? If you're in the learning heart, you might think, wow, do they really talk about stuff like that here? That's pretty, that's either really full on and weird, or, wow, these people really believe what they say. And when I see them putting their hands up singing, it looks like they follow through. If you're in the journeying heart, you might wriggle a little bit. (laughs) You might say, golly, that's a bit close to the bone there. I was quite comfortable with the way I was giving, for instance, and I don't particularly like you even mentioning that. The following heart will say, thank you so much. Thank you for even bringing up that question. I don't know what the answer is, but I want to investigate that. Do you see that many of us who may think that we're kind of in the following heart, actually we're in the kind of journeying heart. It may even be all of us. Why? Who is the one who ultimately is totally surrendered to God? Who is God? It's Jesus. The bar is not in this building. It's the sky. If we approach it with guilt, we'll lose the plot. If you feel guilt creeping in, banish it in Jesus' name get rid of it. I want to talk to you sometime about real guilt and neurotic guilt. There is real guilt we have to deal with sometimes. A lot of us deal with neurotic guilt. That's guilt that doesn't really exist. Just say bye-bye. Don't even come into my head. Get lost. And when you think about giving, think about the joy point, whether it's giving of time or of money. Think about what gives you joy to give. It says in the Bible that God loves a cheerful giver. Think about what would be a challenge. Is it the cheap cup of tea? Is it the full Monty Starbucks latte? Is it, if the sky's the limit, that's even better. But do you know what I mean? Think about what is a challenge to you. And think of the pain point. Think of the point where you could give of your time or your money to the point where you would become bitter. And don't go there. And don't blame anybody else if you get stuck trying to go there. Because your heart will become bitter And if our heart as a church is a collection of all of our hearts, don't bring bitterness into the collective heart. Take responsibility for being around here, but saying, I want to go from journeying to following Christ. Have I lost any of you by shortening this down? It's even better. Praise the maker. This is it. This is it, and then we're done. There is a gateway gift to understanding where to put your heart. And this is how we know about this. It says in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. This is all about the heart, and it's all about the treasure. Mel said it most brilliantly. Don't wait for your heart to get there first before you put your treasure. It doesn't say that. It says that it happens the other way around. Take what I've said, and could every one of us, if we're just starting out, let us be just starting out, if we've been journeying for a while, wherever we're at, could we all agree to take one step forward in every way, whatever that step is? Could we? This would be a really good time for some amens, and then I'll stop. How's that for a deal? Come on, amen. Come on, let's really hear it. Then I will stop. Come on, come on, yeah.